Dennis Archer, discusses his agenda for the city during his inauguration ceremony at City Hall. Mayor Archer, the first new mayor for Detroit in 20 years, replaces Coleman Young, who did not seek re-election. This inauguration took place on Monday. Dennis Wayne Archer. I, Dennis Wayne Archer. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties and responsibilities. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties and responsibilities of the office of Mayor of Detroit. Of the office of Mayor of Detroit. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. When I woke up this morning, I had butterflies in my stomach because I realized I had to come speak before you today. But having gone to the prayer breakfast and listening to the prolific Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson this morning, and then going to the ecumenical service and hearing again from Dr. Frederick G. Sampson of Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church, I'm ready. <laughs> On October 27th, I drove from Ann Arbor to Detroit for the last time to work on my father's campaign. It was Wednesday and there was less than a week left in what had been the most stressful and trying period of my life. For the past four nights, I had not been able to fall asleep in my dorm room. I later found out that my mother was also having problems sleeping. It was not surprising. But that night, I was back in my own room, in my own bed, and I was able to fall asleep. I had a dream that night. My father had been elected mayor. <laughs> My father had been elected mayor, and I was introducing him at his victory party. I told no one of, the, of this dream until now. While others discussed victory celebration, what we would do for the inauguration, and how our lives were going to be different, I chose to focus on the reality of the close race at hand. I thought of asking my aunt to allow me to speak at the victory party, but I decided against it for fear of jinxing my father. <laughs> he never takes anything for granted. Why should I? November 2nd has come and gone. My dream is now reality. Dad won, and we had a wonderful celebration. A couple of weeks later, I called my aunt at home late one night and asked her if I could introduce Dad at the swearing-in. She promised to get back with me. <laughs> After a while, when I had not heard anything and became caught up in my finals, I forgot about it. Then, five days ago, my father said they were taking away two of his 12 minutes so that I could make my comments. I was suddenly speechless. What would I say? What if I cried? Well, I'm here today. And I suppose my topic should be my father, his success, and our city's future. Booker T. Washington, in his book, Up From Slavery, said, to be successful, grow to the point where one completely forgets himself, that is, to lose himself in a great cause. I stand before you today, the son of a lost man. <laughs> Mr. 
lost in the dreams and aspirations of our children, lost in the despair and plight of our homeless and disenfranchised, and lost in the possibilities and potential of the city he now leads. While he is lost, Detroit has made a great find. <laughs> you have found a man who will dedicate his life to you. You have found a man who will relate to all of you, who will listen to all of you, and who will include all of you. I know this to be true because he has been a remarkable father. Many of you ask, how will he do this? Deborah McGriff, in an August 25th, 1991 Free Press article said that, to be successful, you need to embrace change, learn to work with others, and make good choices. Well, Detroit, we have most definitely embraced change. As a matter of fact, we have demanded it and expected it. Rest assured, it will come. Will we work with others? I will let you be the judge of that. We had 6,000 campaign volunteers representing every race, religion, culture, and tax bracket. We received assistance from both city and suburbs, and since November 2nd, my father has been to the White House twice, to meet with the governor twice, and has met with numerous religious and community groups here in the city. Making good choices, that's an easy one. Akua Buddha Watkins, Emmett Baylor, Freeman Hendricks, Ike McKinnon, Mike Sawafa, to name a few. All appointees, they are black, white, Hispanic, Lebanese, women, men, all with impeccable resumes. All good choices. If Ms. McGriff's formula for success is indeed an indicator, we are off to a good start. And finally, to those who ask me whether the campaign had or will take my father away from our family, I answer a resounding no. As a matter of fact, I thank Detroit for this campaign process. It has brought my father and I even closer. And because I know what kind of father he is, I know what kind of mayor he will be. Congratulations, Detroit. You are very lucky. We have somewhat of a uh, sensitive family. <laughs> Madam President of the City Council, honored members of the Council, members of the clergy, national, state, county, and local elected officials, citizens of Detroit, from our suburbs, and from our region, and from around the state, and out of state, and from Windsor, our Council Generals and our United States Ambassador, members of the bench and bar, allow me to begin my remarks with a most appropriate passage from the Bible, Psalms 127.1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Welcome, friends, to a new day in Detroit. We are here today. We are here today, men, women, and children, black and white, Jew, Gentile, Christian, Muslim, Chaldean, Asian, through the grace of a freedom born 
and the dreams and won through the efforts of those who came before us. They have left us a full and a colorful history, full but not complete. Now the task is ours to decide what we will do with this legacy and the new challenges that lay before us. We have the vision, we have the will, we have the determination to make this community what we want it to be. 52 years ago, I was born on the east side of Detroit to parents who were proud but poor. I can only imagine how daunting the road to this moment would have looked to them. My mom and dad are no longer alive, but my two uncles, James and Warren Garner, my parents by marriage, James and Eleanor Duncombe, my closest friend and Trudy sister, C. Beth Duncombe and her husband, Joe Brown, represent my close family unit outside of my wife, Trudy, and our two sons, Dennis Jr. and Vincent. So if I'm optimistic today about our future, it's in part because of the road that I've traveled and because of the lessons my parents taught me through their example, that hard work and determination can overcome great obstacles and break down barriers that seem insurmountable. Barriers the election of an African-American mayor at one time seemed insurmountable, but one tough and inspired leader broke those barriers down and has spent the last 20 years in service to this great city and its people. For those who might speculate, let me hasten to assure that my wife and I spent about 30 to 45 minutes with Mayor Young this past Thursday. He wanted me to let you know that if he was not able to make it, that it was not because he does not support and will work very closely with me and my administration, but rather it was because his health might keep him away from this event. So Mr. Mayor, I want you to know that today as we launch a new chapter, we cannot forget the monumental and truly monumental figure that Detroit has in its history, and that's you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. You're a tough act to follow, and I have no illusions about the difficulties that lie ahead. For Detroit to do better, we must be willing to believe that we can do better. We must b believe again in ourselves and in our city. I'm here today because I believe so strongly that with great effort and a new spirit of openness and cooperation, we can meet the challenges we face as a city. We are all here today because we love Detroit. When these next four years are history, let it be said that together, we help make Detroit safer and stronger. But most of all, let it be said that we help restore hope that Detroit's future will indeed be bright. <laughs> City government must play a central role in that process, and it begins with one simple commitment. We will provide to the citizens of this city the basic services which they demand and to which they are entitled. We will pick up the garbage, light the street lamps, and yes, put more police on the streets in order to restore public confidence and a decent quality of life for our people. I look forward to working with our great city employees, those represented by unions and those not represented by unions, and with each and every member of our outstanding city council to provide the quality services to each and every neighborhood. That is something that people have a right to demand of their government, and something a responsive government must deliver. While we're faced with a budget shortfall of extraordinary proportions, a deficit we must confront openly and honestly, we cannot, however, deprive the people of Detroit, our valued customers, the service they need. In the areas of finance and budgeting, we indeed face numerous and significant difficult challenges. In the short term, we must fix the current financial situation. On the revenue side, the tax burden is already too high in addition to being at the legal limit in most areas. 
On the expenditure side, the city has been spending more than it takes in, and it must stop. We must manage more with less. We need to cut spending and become more productive in all areas. We'll be calling on all parties to contribute their fair share to the solution of expenditure reductions. Everything must be and will be reevaluated. Specifically, it is my plan to hold taxes, cut spending, seek efficiencies, perhaps sell certain assets, and refinance certain debt. The plan must be in place by the deadline for budget submission in April. We must develop a comprehensive, workable economic revival and development plan. We must set priorities and utilize all of our great physical and geographic resources, along with our political and economic influence. If we do not take the hard steps now, then we must accept the choice of not having a future. That is a choice I will not accept. Let us not expect nor promise too much and fuel the cynicism so many of our people already feel. The truth is, is that city government alone cannot solve all of Detroit's problems. We can and we will work day and night to improve the economic climate and attract more investment to our city. But we in turn must ask the business community to match its encouraging words with support of tangible commitments that create real jobs. For this great crusade to redeem our city to succeed, everybody must pitch in. I'm going to make the revitalization of our neighborhoods one of my highest priorities. <laughs> However, every citizen must take responsibility. Everyone who has an interest in Detroit must do their part. Sweep the sidewalk in front of your house. <laughs> clean, clean the rubbish from the storm sewer on your street. Pick up the broken glass in your alley. Go with your neighbors to cut the weeds on the lot on the way to your streets. Demand, demand that I get the trash picked up on time. Insist that I make the buses run on time. Let yourself see our police, our firefighters, our emergency medical workers are working hard on your behalf. Recognize their contribution, praise it, help them do their jobs. Demand to it that I see that they do it right. Get a grip on your life and the lives of your children. children rest the destiny or the destruction of our community. In their hands is the future of our society. Stand with me when I tell the dope man, get off our streets. Stand with me. Stand with me when I tell the dope man, leave our children alone. Get out of our way. We're taking back our children and we're taking With all of us standing together, believe me when I say this, hear me and believe it. We will prevail through greater cooperation between the police and the community. We can begin to roll back this tidal wave of crime. We can and we must provide better alternatives for our children through a greater cooperation between our schools and our churches and most importantly, parents throughout our city. We can truly save our most precious resource our children.
to our friends, to our friends in neighboring communities. I say that you too have a great stake in Detroit's future, as we are the hub of this region. You benefit from our assets as a city, and you cannot wall off our problems. You have too much to offer us, and we have too much to offer you. In recognition of these mutual interests, I extend a warm hand of cooperation and look forward to productive ways in which we might work closely together in a spirit of mutual respect. In that same sense, in that same sense and in that same spirit, I say to the governor and our legislative leaders, that we are ready to make the case for Detroit because Michigan has a huge stake in the future of its greatest city. We ask only for what is fair and just. Help Detroit help itself and you will have made a great investment in Michigan's future. In Michigan's future. For Detroiters, I ask you to reach out, talk to your neighbor, reach out, see who needs some help and give it. Reach out when you need some help. Believe that someone cares. Believe that help is coming. See it when it's offered, accept it when it comes, and give it back to the next one who can use a hand. Reach out your hand. See that it takes you halfway to the person next to you. Reach out from behind Jefferson Chalmers to Brightmoor, from Clark Park to Palmer Park, from the river to the fairgrounds. Reach across Woodward Avenue that for too long has divided East Siders from West Siders. Reach out across Eight Mile Road, across Telegraph, across our beautiful river, an asset too long wasted. Tell our friends in Birmingham, in Dearborn, in Mount Clemens, in Windsor, we're in this thing together. And we're in it for the long haul, each time, in ways we can't deny, even if we wanted to. Very few people have felt the thrill that I experienced today taking the oath of office as mayor of this great city. And with that thrill comes a profound sense of gratitude to the thousands of volunteers and supporters who helped make this day possible. To my wonderful wife, Judge Trudy Duncan Archer, and our spectacular sons, Jonathan Vincent. I've truly been blessed to be the instrument of a great movement, but I know with that honor comes responsibility, the responsibility to work as hard as I know how to achieve our shared vision of a Detroit on the men and on the move, a Detroit where our streets are once again safe and our children and senior citizens are secure, a Detroit where good jobs abound and our people have the education and training to fill them, a Detroit where all of us live together in an atmosphere of trust and cooperation a Detroit that is known and appreciated the world over. As I close, I ask you to put your hand in my hand. Take the hand of the person next to you. Stand up, stand hand in hand and side by side. Lift your spirit, raise your hopes, come with me. Ain't nothing gonna stop us now. Detroit for all and all for Detroit. The Detroit mayoral inauguration was held on Monday. Mayor Archer is the first new mayor of Detroit in 20 years.